Hello, and welcome to a parallel project training podcast. This podcast is recorded with the APM PMQ syllabus for exams starting September 2024. My name's Ruth Phillips, and I'm here today with my colleague and senior project trainer, Lisa Regan, to talk about change control. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Hi, Ruth. Happy to talk about change. It's a topic that we should be, as project managers, quite comfortable with, although we do need to make sure that it's controlled on our projects, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. The only constant is change, if that makes sense. Let's have a look at the syllabus then. Uh, The learning objective is to understand change control as the ability to manage variations and change requests in a controlled way. That's the key here, isn't it? That we've got to think about the control uh, of change because change will happen. Our, Our project is there to introduce change, but we've also got to manage change within uh, the project. We've got five learning outcomes for this syllabus topic, but they're all centred around the change control process. We'll address each one of them as we go through the stages of a typical change control process. This first learning outcome is to understand the purpose and importance of each stage in the change control process. Um, Let's talk about that, Lisa. Could you give me a high level run through of what what a change control process looks like? And then we'll delve into each stage. Starting from the top, someone Mm. makes a change request. Yeah. We'll we'll go into the detail of what that involves. Um, Then the project manager would step in and do an initial evaluation. Is the change even worth evaluating? Yeah. And at that point, you're allowed to say no. If it is worth evaluating, you move on and dig a bit deeper into the detailed evaluation and we'll look at the kind of things that are impacted and how you go away and and talk to your subject matter experts to do that. Okay. Once all that's in place, you talk to the sponsor and you make a recommendation and that involves, and again, we'll, we'll go into the detail, approving, rejecting or deferring the change. Right. Once that's decided, if you're accepting, if you're approving that change, you'd move on to update your plans modify those plans, we'll dig into how configuration supports that. And then when that's all done, we move on to implementing that change and updating all our plans and telling everyone about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's the high level process. Let's look at each step in turn. So the first step is requesting that change. And we've got a learning outcome that says that we've also got to understand what should be captured and recorded in change requests. So can anyone request a change on the project? Well, I think so. We should be allowed to. Having a formal way of capturing change sometimes, and I'm going to smile now, sometimes puts people off, which isn't always a bad thing. Being serious about it, it means that the people that put change requests in have considered it because they can't just you know, say, oh, I fancy this. They've got to fill a form in. Yeah, and they've got it's got to be done in a controlled way. Have the kind of things we, we will be asking them to put in a change request, uh, things like the reason for the change fundamentally, yeah. you know, why are you asking for the change, the kind of areas that you think are going to be impacted. Yeah. Ask them but to give a quick overview. Uh, obviously, the date that the change was raised, uh, just a bit of a description about yeah. it. They've got to put some thought into it. And I think forcing them to do that, yeah. you know, if they think I'm not really that bothered, it's not important enough if that Absolutely. makes sense. It's, I, it's I, bit... I really agree Bert, with that. I think you've got this balance to make sure that the form is user-friendly enough mm-hmm. so that people will complete it and will comply with your process rather than trying yeah. to get things in through the back door. Yeah. But that you're capturing enough detail. So as you said, people have really thought about it and they want Mm -hmm. to do it. The number of times when I've heard on projects, oh, could you just? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, I like that. And it's to try to to stop the could you just and scope creep getting in at that point in uh, in time. Yeah. Yeah, Okay, so that's requesting um, our change. Then we move into initial evaluation. So Mm -hmm. what what happens there and uh, why do we do that? Yeah, in initial evaluation, we as project managers, we've got to think, is the change even worth evaluating? Because and I know, not, not trying to be dismissive, but sometimes they are asking for something that is just impossible. And sometimes you can see that immediately. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. that sense check. You're allowed to say, no, unfortunately, that would cost too much. It would have too big of an impact. And you can see that immediately. You know, you don't need all the bells and whistles and the detailed analysis to tell you that. 
Sometimes it's glaringly obvious. Tell them, oh, unfortunately, no, we can't do this, but these are the reasons why. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's too impactful in terms of time, in terms of cost, in terms of quality. Initial evaluation is to stop you giving that detailed time and effort to something which was never going to be a goer. There's a couple of things to think about there. It's so important, first of all, that communication, as you said, yeah. go back to the person that's requested it and explain yeah. why you are rejecting it after that yeah. initial evaluation. Because if you don't do that, either they're waiting for this yeah. to be implemented yeah. or they, they might then say, I'm actually going to talk to my friend in the development team because, you know, the project yeah. manager is not listening to me. So I, yeah. I think that communication is really important. Yeah. There's also some practical reasons, I think, sometimes that things will get rejected at initial evaluation. Maybe two people have identified yeah. the same change yeah. and you just, you're not going to go through yeah. the same process twice. So you're just doing it once. So yeah. you can go back to the person that's requested and said, yeah, Susan's already request yeah. this so we'll update you when that uh, goes through yeah. the process that's a good point like you said Ruth it's just about showing them that you have considered it yeah but these are the re this is why it's absolutely. not going any further yeah absolutely so if we don't reject it at initial evaluation mm -hmm. we take it then into detailed evaluation and we've got another yeah. learning objective here we've got to think about ways to assess options related to a proposed change and the high level impact of that proposed change what do we do to evaluate this in more detail so we could take away the detail. We start to think through the implications. My, my phrase is always dropping a pebble in the pond with change. It's not just, you know, this is the change. It's one of the implications. Anything that, that will impact, impact your success factors, that's what you've got to start with, isn't it? So your time, cost and quality fundamentally, yeah. anything to do with risk, anything to do with benefits, anything that impacts on your stakeholders, do that detailed evaluation not on your own go and talk to your subject matter experts yeah. because sometimes you don't understand as, as the project manager understand the implications but there will be people in the team that can say hang on a minute if we do that x the dominoes will start to fall on the project do go and talk to those subject matter experts to get their opinions to help you d do that evaluation and there might be things uh, uh, that the subject matter experts will know about that you don't external <laughs> factors regulation, yeah. Yeah. accreditations, and anything yeah. like that could be affected by something. You might see it as a fairly straightforward change, but when you start talking to the stakeholders, the end users, you realise that actually this has got a much bigger impact than initially yeah, understood. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's that deeper dive. That's what we're yeah. looking for, aren't we? To get that information and to work out actually it, what does it mean for our project. It's useful to think about the, the point in the project at which the change mm. is being requested. We, if we're getting a change early on in, let's say, concept definition or even in yeah. the early stages of deployment, it's probably less impactful, less cost yeah. to make that change. But if this is towards the end of the project, this could really upset the apple cart and, and have lots of implications. There's so much to think about when you're considering that change. Yeah. We've now got a really good handle on what the impacts are, what options we've got related to uh, that, that change, and uh, we've got that detailed evaluation. So we move on to recommendation. What happens here? So recommendation, the three options that we've got, we can either accept, reject, or defer. Okay. Now, I'll go for reject first because that's probably the simplest one. If you've decided that it's, you know, that it's not going to be um, taken forward, a bit like we said earlier, please tell the people that asked, yeah. yeah? Please tell them, this is what we've done. We've looked into this. This is the kind of impact it's going to have, and we can't do it. I mean, you might be saying, you might go to defer and say, we can't do it now, but in the next round of the project, we might do. We yes. might. It's a good suggestion. Yeah. We might be able to build that in next time, but we're not able to build it in at this moment in time. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, when you're coming up with these recommendations, I think we kind of hinted at it, but the kind of things you should be looking at are, have you got the skills and resources? Have yeah. you, it's that time, cost and quality. Have you got the, the funds to deliver? Will it mean that we're going to be late with the project? Accept is the positive way forward. That's one of the options you can say, thank you for the suggestion. We are going to take it on board. Um, but of course, to do that, you've then got to understand the implications of what yeah. that means going forward. We've got to understand how to justify recommendations. It's about that time, cost, quality yeah. It's like a mini business case for the change, it is. isn't it, it is. really? It is. It's what areas of your project are going to be impacted. It might affect absolutely everything, but usually with change requests, it's quite local, isn't it? It's quite a local change. So is it going to affect this particular delivery team? Is it going to really impact on how they work? 
or is it a more generic change? It's justifying it in that way to say yeah. we need it and it's going to impact these people and it's going to improve what they do, upskill them or whatever the change is going to make, be yeah. made. I think that we have a negative attitude towards change, that it's maybe that we haven't scoped something correctly or we haven't identified a requirement correctly or it's, it's yeah. something that we've done wrong in the project yeah. that requires that change. Sometimes these are good ideas. Oh, absolutely. These yeah. are ideas that could help us manage a risk yeah. or yeah. make the way that we're doing something more efficient. And it just hasn't come to light until we know more about the project or technology has changed. Ab absolutely. I think as project managers, change has a bit of a bad reputation, yes. doesn't it, really? That's the way to think about it. But we should look at it in a, pos in a positive light. If it's improving the way that we're doing things, absolutely. Change is good. As project managers, we, we get bogged down in the detail of the, oh, no, not another one that I've got to process. But yeah. try and look at it in the light that says, you know, we're making things better for the next project and the next project, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Now, you uh, mentioned controlling change. Yeah. And we've got this discipline of configuration management there that I think is really helpful in underpinning that control of change. So tell me a little bit about how configuration management relates to the, these steps in the process. So we cover configuration under requirements so that yeah. the detail will be covered in that a different podcast on requirements. However, the process of configuration for me, I keep using that, that analogy, it's the pebble in the pond. You've got a change that you need to make how do you know which part of, for example, of your PMP that needs to be changed? Yeah. You do that through configuration. So you look back at your product breakdown structure and all those implications. This has got to change. That also means that the next configuration yeah. item has also got to be changed and it ripples through. It's what ver not only what version are we on, but when a change comes in and you accept the change, the great example, Ruth, it's a very quick one, is that table with four legs. If you, if somebody saws off five centimetres of one of those legs, how yeah. do you know that the other three need to be changed through configuration? So yeah. when a change is actioned, that's when, for me, configuration comes to the fore. You can't just say, we'll just change one part of it and hope, oh my goodness, yeah. depending on the complexity of your project and, and of your product, there are going to be Im implications. That's what configuration yeah. is about. It's the implications of change. Absolutely. There's two aspects to why configuration management is so important to go hand in hand with change control. One is that individual focused aspect of what's the latest version of this that we're going to be changing? Yeah. Where is it? Who owns it? Or all of that kind of stuff about the individual item that's changing. The second thing is about the relationships and the implications, as, as you said. If that changes, what is the knock on effect? What else yeah. will have to change with that? Configuration management helps you to understand what, what the implications are. If we have now um, made the recommendation about what to do with our change, the next step is to update plans. And our final learning outcome is that we need to understand the importance of updating plans and schedules and to reflect and communicate changes. So what, what are we doing uh, at this point in time? Okay, so when we're updating our plans, it's we're talking about the PMP, aren't we? Our plans and our schedules. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't do that, Information is going to be out of date. We're not taking into account those implications. If people are working on different versions, it could mean that projects are delayed. Conflict is going to happen. Oh, you're working on that version. I'm still on this version. What's going on? Higher level stakeholders could start to become disengaged from the project. They could start to lose confidence if they're thinking, do you know what's going on on your project? It sounds like things are pretty chaotic. Yeah. You know, if you can't keep up with the updating of the plans and the schedules. Yeah. Um, on a really higher level, you might not realise those benefits in the business case. Fundamentally, if things are working in that real chaotic, that I think it's the, the APM have got a phrase, haven't they, spiralling into chaos. That's what happens if you're not completely being robust about which plans and schedules have got to be updated. Yeah, it's about communication. As, yeah, as well. Yeah. It's about, first of all, communicating to team members to make sure that they know what it is that they've now got to be doing so that they, yeah. they're not doing the wrong thing. But yeah. very importantly, I think the communication helps manage stakeholder expectations. Because if you were a, a stakeholder that has got a medium degree of interest in this project, yeah. you're not maybe having regular face-to-face -face meetings, you're just being kept updated with things. And you might have one picture in your mind about what's going to be delivered if yeah. you're not 
told about changes to that, yeah. you get to the fact that this now comes into operational use and you have to start using this or going to this new building. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite how you imagined it in the beginning because something's changed. It's really unsettling. And as you said, it, it gets bad reputation for the project. People don't yeah. use it. Benefits don't get delivered. It's yeah. huge amounts of knock-on effects, really from a, just a simple act of communication. That's it. That's updating plans. And then implement, I guess, is as simple as just carrying out those plans. She yeah, said simple. <laughs> but it's looking at your communications plan as well, isn't it? And making sure on your racing matrix, making sure that the right people get that information, get those updates that they should do. That's a good look at each of those stages within a typical change control process. We've tied those into the other learning outcomes. There's just yeah. one other thing that the syllabus asks us to do, and okay. that is to understand how the change control process and the, the stages would be different for linear and iterative life cycles. How, how does this work in, a, in an iterative life cycle? What we've been talking about so far relates to the linear life cycle because mm -hmm. we've got that scope agreed up front, change control coming in to make a change to the baseline. Whereas iterative, it's a different story, isn't it? Change control. We don't need a procedure because it's embedded. Change control is part of your iterative development process because you're starting with that planning meeting that says, what we're going to be doing in this iteration, how we're going to carry that out, what we're going to deliver, and it's set for the iteration. Yeah. And any kind of changes that come along are absorbed. Is that the right word to say? Yes. It's the modus operandi. It's the way that we work around here yeah. with iterative yeah. is that you absorb change. You're looking for change, aren't you? You're looking yeah. for the best way to do things that will most um, fully satisfy what the customer wants. Any kind of changes to features that come back in, you accept them and you roll with it. We don't need a formal process because it's part of the day-to-day -day work. It goes back to the fact that the linear life cycle scope is set, yeah. agreed, yeah. upfront, and then what we're trying to do is manage change to that scope. Whereas within our iterative life cycle, the scope's evolving, so it, it, yeah. it will be changing. This process is the way you work on an iterative project. If you think about all of those steps, mm -hmm. they're probably being done, but they're yeah. just done as part and parcel That's of the it. ways of working. So That's you'll it. have your project team, you'll have your users, your product owner in there, mm -hmm. and they will request yes. things yeah. to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll probably discuss them within the team mm -hmm. and you'll probably throw some of those ideas out and that'll be yeah. your initial evaluation. Yeah. Then the detail evaluation, you'll go through all sorts of stuff about storyboarding and thinking yeah. about time and thinking yeah. about benefits and yeah. prioritization with Moscow and all, all of yeah. those kind of things. And then, as you said, as part of your sprint planning, you'll identify which of these items are going to be recommended maybe yeah. for that backlog. Then you'll make your plans and implement them yeah. and then review them. That is just the iterative life cycle. Yeah. It's not a separate process yeah it, yeah it's it not is. a standalone thing like it is linear it's really interesting to consider because i've said this a few times on the podcast is that i i think we often think of the iterative life cycle as the wild west that there's no control there yeah. is but yeah. it's in a different way and we're That's right. trying to encourage innovation and change yeah not control and, and prevent it in a way i agree I iterative in itself is that flexible adaptable way of working yeah absolutely yeah well we've had a great discussion about change control there lisa i've really enjoyed that thank you very much okay thanks ruth no problem thanks bye-bye bye-bye